Well, good deal. Well, thanks for having me back and listening to me ramble on some more uh, about, you know, my favorite subject. Um, and so we spent the first part talking about the, the Bamberger Ranch and the habitat restoration model based off of understanding the grassland savanna ecosystem and how that all tied together. So no matter what ecosystem you have, you have to start thinking about uh, energy and how energy flows through your system. And so this lecture is going to be on that, the, uh, the importance of understanding those trophic levels and what that means for habitat management and creating a management plan. So with energy being the key to everything, to understand your system and map out a habitat plan or restoration plan, let's look at how that energy flows through the system. Now remember, system and ecosystem are the same thing when I'm talking about that. So no matter what, you've got your primary producers that get consumed, then that leads to energy moving up, you lose a little energy here and there, but energy all starts with the sun. So you can view energy transfer as a food chain in a linear fashion. You can view energy transfer as a food web and how connected things are. But realistically, you have to understand the trophic levels. So we're gonna be concentrating on looking the broad picture pyramid style with your primary producers at the bottom, those are your autotrophs that produce their own energy and how they get consumed by your primary consumers. Okay, those are what's directly eating the, um, the autotrophs. So those are your herbivores. Then that goes up to your carnivores and your secondary carnivores all the way up through your um, apex predators. And decomposers, like fungi and worms, the tritivores are all playing a huge role in all of this because that's where the waste is getting used. So each level on this pyramid is important. And remember, grasses are on the same level that your wildflowers, your forbs are, that your trees and shrubs are. And then as you keep going up, your insects are considered primary consumers. And then you have a lot of small mammals that are considered primary consumers. And then that energy keeps flowing up, okay? And those detritivores fill in those gaps on each side of these, uh, on, in between each one of these pyramids. So now we kind of understand what's happening with energy, but let's start thinking about regulation. That In the first part, I talked a little bit about um, each ecosystem needing regulation. So are these ecosystems regulated or controlled from the bottom up? Meaning, when you look at this pyramid, do the grasses and forbs control the primary consumers? And do the primary consumers control the secondary consumers and so on? Or are these ecosystems regulated from the top down? The apex predators, controlling all of those other levels. And here is the very long, complicated answer to those questions. It depends. And that's what you need to understand. So I'm gonna play a, um, a short five minute video here that will kind of use the top-down model, i.e. the apex predators um, controlling ecosystems so that we get an idea, this is a really famous model, and this is not the, the Bamberger Ranch. This is the Wolves of Yellowstone. In 1995, something really Can exciting hear it? happened in the nation's mm -hmm. first park, Yellowstone. 41 wild wolves are reintroduced here by scientists. After 100 years of being hunted, wolves could once again call this place home. The wolves thrived, but something else very surprising happened. Their return had a spectacular effect on the landscape, an effect that spread wider than anyone thought possible. So how did this all happen? In the past, wolves were seen as a risk to people and livestock, and they were exterminated from the Yellowstone area in the 1920s. The elk's main predator was gone, 
and their population more than doubled. Elk are both grazers and browsers, so they eat grass, shrubs, and trees. They overgraze the entire park, upsetting the natural balance of the ecosystem. Mammals like mice and rabbits could not use the plants to hide from predators, and their populations fell dramatically. Grizzly bears suffered as the elk munch away their berry supply, which they badly need to build up fat before hibernating. Pollinators like bees and hummingbirds had fewer flowers to feed on, songbirds less trees to nest in. Perhaps the elk's most devastating impact was how they affected the park's riverbanks. When the wolf was around, elk were vulnerable when they moved down towards rivers to drink. They would never spend too long by the water, for they could be ambushed. But with the apex predators gone, they gorged themselves, faster than the shrubs could grow, and gathered in great herds on the lush river banks. The mass of elk's hooves eroded the river banks, so the rivers and streams clouded with soil. The fish inherited murky homes. And without trees and clean water, beavers couldn't build their dams to live in. Without the protection of the dams, fish, amphibians, and otters suffered even more. And all because of the missing wolf. Now, with as many as 100 gray wolves in Yellowstone National Park, their reintroduction is having an effect that even surprised scientists. Wolves have contributed to bringing elk numbers down from 17,000 in 1995 to just 4,000 today. Since only the healthiest of elk survive, the population is much more robust. All of these elk kills mean more carcasses for scavengers like coyotes, eagles, and ravens. Grizzly bear numbers have increased too. The grizzlies benefit from the wolves' elk kills, and less elk also means more berries. And just the elk's fear of wolves gives the riverbank trees, like aspen and willow, a chance to regenerate. They can grow to five times their original size in just six years. The songbirds are returning too. And the bigger trees along the rivers means greater root structures, which means stronger riverbanks and less erosion clean water and big trees, beaver paradise. The return of the beaver dams creates new habitats for fish, amphibians, reptiles, and even otters. This shows just some of the trickle-down effects of the wolves' reintroduction, known to scientists as a trophic cascade. The trophic cascade doesn't stop there though. The wolves are even helping us. In 2005, over 100,000 visitors went to Yellowstone National Park just to see the wolves. Pumping $30 million into the local economy, money for jobs and livelihoods. Factor in that wolves contribute to the health and diversity of all Yellowstone's wildlife and its impact is staggering. The wolf's benefits also cascade down to the 106,000 residents of Billings, Montana. Their drinking water, Yellowstone River, is now cleaner. Who would have thought that just bringing back some wolves could produce such far-reaching benefits for nature and for people? From the tips of taller trees down to its cleaner rivers, these wild wolves have rebalanced and restored our nation's very first national park. That does a really good job of, of summing everything up um, about how connected those trophic levels are. And by removing one of those rungs, you take away energy out of the system. And so when you think about managing for your, um, for your habitat, you have to know how your habitat works from the top down and from the bottom up. Now, bottom up is really important for um, areas like I'm at with the grassland savanna. 
knowing what kept those primary producers healthy, the bison, right? And then how that floated up levels. But for areas like Yellowstone and forested areas, a lot of that is top down, making sure that your predators are healthy enough to regulate energy down the system. So it kind of really all depends on whether it's bottom up or top down based on where you are and based on how your system works. So the classic example, no, no wolves on the landscape, no trees. Not a, it's not a healthy ecosystem. The balance was out of whack, right? Wolves don't build soil. Your grazers and your birds do with their poo. So when you think about animal impact and you're managing habitat, it doesn't necessarily matter what your animal model is. What matters is how you use those animals to mimic what mother nature would do to help keep your healthy oil, your soil healthy. So that picture is a, we have a herd of um, African antelope on the ranch called scimitar horned oryx. Three oryx equals one cow. So when you think about your landscape, we have what's called carrying capacity. And that's the amount of, of biomass one animal unit is considered about a thousand pounds of biomass. That's basically a calf and a cow. You know, one bull bison is, a, is an animal unit. So three of those oryx equal one animal unit. And that all comes down to how healthy your habitat is and how many animals you can sustain. When Mr. Benenberger first bought the ranch in 1969, it took 40 acres to sustain one animal unit. We can now run an animal unit, um, and this is gonna average the entire ranch, but we can now run an animal unit to 18 acres. So we're doing a heck of a lot better than what we were doing. But it doesn't matter if you're using oryx or if you're using cows. Every animal has a role and has its own set of nutritional needs. Cows are grazers. Okay, they do very little browsing. They'll, they'll pick at oaks here and there, but for the most part, they want grasses. What made bison so important is they're considered what's uh, called an intermediate grazer. So they'll browse eating trees, eating shrubs, eating vines, woody species, or they'll graze depending on what's available and, and considering what's um, most palatable. So when, when you think about the ranch, Mr. Bamberger was building soil, not only through using animal impact, i.e. poo, but also by managing it the way mother nature would, because it doesn't have to be animals. Fire can reset these landscapes too. Remember these fire cycles are natural and cyclical. So you can manage, you can mimic that. And this is a, a burn that we did in our hilltop. And again, the idea is to knock back the woody species and clear room, just like mother nature would, for wildflowers. Okay, open up space for the grass to grow back again, reset the system, get rid of that litter, that organic material, that thatch that will actually kill um, out its, itself. Remember our bunch grasses kill themselves in a four to seven year cycle. So when the bison weren't coming through and the animals weren't grazing it, it's likely it was getting burned before that grass could do that. So these, so grazing and fires opened up and let a lot of these species come back. And it's not just um, species that bloom that are important for pollinators, right? It's all about that diversity. So you have different plants that help build your soil. Okay, you have what are called nitrogen fixing plants. So even in plant succession, all right, if you remember way back to, to that um, slide, you have plants like doveweed, which is a croton species that is called a pioneer plant. So it moves into a barren landscape first and it sets its root out and it increases. And so if it's not grazed, it will just spread everywhere it can. And then it fixes nitrogen in that soil. So it's taking um, carbon out of the atmosphere and it's converting that into um, CO2 and then it's helping store and change um, those, uh, those molecules and putting nitrogen back into the soils. Crops like peanuts and legumes help do that too. So everything has its role, but you have to know 
what stage to do that in. And Mr. Blamberger has planted over 4,000 trees on the ranch. And it's not all one species. And I like showing this particular slide because you can see, let me fire up the laser pointer here. On the right hand side, that tree right there is called Eve's necklace. It's a Sephora species. So it's related to uh, mountain laurel. Uh, beautiful um, flowers, beautiful white flowers. But he already has his hole dug. And then he's gonna plant a small wildflower in there as well. That's a, a mealy sage right there. So all in this one little um, square area that he made his soil, um, he's increased the biodiversity with just two plants. And then the grasses are gonna move back in and cover that up. And as that tree grows, and then more diversity is gonna grow back in. So you kind of have to know what you have lost to know how to get back there again. And when you think about where we are in central Texas, you start opening up your guidebooks and you see what the rare and endangered plants in your area are. Then you do a little bit of natural history and you go, okay, why don't we have such and such plant anymore? Why don't we have such and such plant anymore? Well, we know we lost plants like Eve's necklace and mealy sage to overbrowsing, the habitat space. So as the ranch in the uh, early 1800s or in the mid 1800s became um, slowly at the turn of the century turned into a cattle and goat ranch, a true uh, meat animal operation, no longer open range, all of these voids um, that got created were from the candy plants, like your Eve's necklace, like your cherry trees, like your walnuts, that the animals that browse, i.e. goats and deer and elk, are gonna to go to first. So a lot of times it's just knowing what you should have and then planning on where you, then you can go, where do you put it? This plant right here is called the Texas snowbell. And these beautiful bell-like flowers um, are a dead giveaway from that heart-shaped leaf. And this tree is an absolute candy plant. Animals love it. It's got a high, um, uh, the leaves are high in carbohydrates and antioxidants. So it's a very, very palatable plant and very important for pollinators too. But this is one that was only, that's only found in riparian areas. So now if you think back to that video of that huge flood coming through, this is a fairly shallow rooted plant. So this is a plant that would be on the upper side of that hundred um, year flood plant. So not only are, is it getting browsed out, but when it's losing its leaves to browsing, the root structure isn't as healthy because it can't photosynthesize as well, which means the, wheat, the roots become weak. And when you get one of those flooding events, you can actually uproot it. When you uproot it, it's really difficult for that plant to survive. So this is a, um, a, a rare plant in central Texas where I am and it's endangered as you go out west along the Devils and Nueces watersheds um, because the amount of exotic animals that are now on the landscape. So it's not just goats and cows anymore. It's animals from Africa like Aldad that can come in and get to that habitat and just wreak havoc on it. So you have to know what it is, i.e. what species you're looking at, what species you wanna manage for, what you wanna put back on your landscape for your habitat restoration and where it wants to grow. But you have to put your boots out on the ground and spend time exploring and looking. A hillside like this looks really tough and hard to walk through. And it is, it's not easy, but you don't know what might be up here. If it looks tough for you to get up there, well, it's probably tough for animals to get up in there too. Animals, especially deer, are super lazy. So when you see vegetation like this, you know, our grassland, you can see some of the cedar skeletons. This is not an area that we bulldozed. This is one of the last areas that we cleared here on the ranch, and this was all cut by hand. It is not much fun doing that this time of year when it's 98 degrees out, um, but it has to get done. 
So a lot of this was cut down. And what we started to see were really important trees, right where my laser pointer is. I'm going to move that laser pointer here in a second and look at that color green that kind of stands out right there. So that lime colored green, that is a tree called a Texas madrone, another candy plant that is rare um, and disappearing in central Texas. Those trees are hidden amongst the juniper forest. So when Mr. Bamberger was going through the ranch and just bulldozing everything, that's not being selective. So he was taking out all the madrones and he's taking out all of the little trees that had some protection, some shelter from browse. So those juniper forests weren't all bad because a thicket like that has all that seed stock from those birds and those raccoons going out, eating those cherries, coming back into that nice dense um, shrubland that was the juniper forest, those cedar brakes. Then it's gonna eat that because it's safe from predators in there and it's gonna poop. And then that is gonna grow, it's gonna grow. But the problem with those juniper um, thickets is that the resources those plants need to really grow and thrive are taken up by the cedar or prevented from getting to them. So these plants become stunted and end up dying off at a certain level. But if you can go in to these landscapes and start cutting out some of that stuff selectively, a lot of times you don't have to dig holes and plant trees. They're there. They're already there. And even in a um, cedar forest, just by raking the detritus, the leaf litter, you're going to open up a lot of space for these plants that just naturally move in. A lot of the plants that we deal with in North America are wind dispersed or animal dispersed. So we don't necessarily have to plant them. We just have to have seed stock around somewhere. And so for us, after Mr. Bamberger was, got that juniper cleared out, he, he tells you he bought tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of grass seed, and he didn't have to. Okay, That grass naturally moves in because it's wind dispersed or it's bison dispersed. So bison are really an ecosystem engineer. They have these perfect spade-shaped hoof. So it's not like a cow that's flat. They are actually little wedges and they wedge into the ground. And in the bottom, they have two little cups, okay? And those cups store mud and seed from all over the country. So on their migratory pathway, they're help spreading that all around. Again, ecosystem engineers, really important. So for our grasslands and our trees and our shrub diversity, patience was key. Planting one or two trees, letting them get to maturity, and then mother nature does the rest. And then once that starts happening, the habitat improves, you start to find things that are rare, like frogs that weren't on the landscape 50 years ago. And this little guy right here is a yellow mud turtle. These yellow mud turtles need um, water year round, okay? They are a turtle. They do really well in the desert, surprisingly enough, but they're tied to these potholes. They're tied to bison wallows historically. So these, those big pools that would just form naturally from um, seasonal rains and then the bison not being there. So again, we're going to consider these animals indicator species. By having frogs and by having um, this yellow mud turtle, we know that our habitat is connected. We know that our water systems are connected because the animals were able to naturally come back. So not every species can tell you something about the landscape. Grazers and browsers can tell you a lot about what's happening with your um, primary producers, your, your, your vegetation health, but they can't really tell you what's going on in terms of habitat. You need to find a different model. For us, again, we don't have to look any further than the birds. There's over 690 species of birds in Texas. So in the early 70s, you know, the first five years of restoration, we were only able to document 48 species. With our 222 species now, we know our habitat is better. And it continually gets better because we've been adding about one bird species a year. Which brings up a really interesting question. 
as a land manager and as a land steward, what is our limiting factor for bird diversity? Well, when you think of that 690 plus species of birds in Texas, you know, why does Texas have so many birds? Well, we're in the central flyway, but we also have a large swath of coastline. So the birds that we're missing, when you look at the species that we have on our list compared to what we don't have, okay, we go, well, how would we get, how would we attract some of those birds? Well, we'd have to put in wetlands. We, we can't move the Texas coast back here. Like, like you know, this was oceanfront property in, in the mid Cretaceous period. But I don't think those people in Austin are gonna let us move the coastline all the way back up here. So how are we gonna do that? Well, one of the projects that we are writing grants for right now is to take parts of the creek and essentially flood the plains, flood some of those valleys again in a seasonal type way, right? So then getting cattails and getting more of that marshland vegetation type in there. So that will increase our diversity. And with the amount of water that we're then creating, we're hoping to have animals like otters back. And we're hoping to get beavers back. And beavers are another perfect keystone species. Okay? They build rivers. So think about Yellowstone um, here in the plains of Northeast Texas and Southeast um, Oklahoma, beavers are, are epic. We needed the beavers to work in conjunction with the bison because there's a lot of species of arthropods, different crayfish. There's a lot of species of turtle that relied on these beavers damming this area and creating these ephemeral um, wetlands or these temporary wetlands, much like the, the bison wallows used to be. But instead of a bison wallow that's you know, 10 foot by 10 foot circle in a dish, we're now talking about flooding 10, 20, 30 acres, you know, moving the creek bank for a month, for two months during the wet season. And then as that water recedes, all that life goes back into the river and then everything kind of resets. So it's really important to, to think about that. So the birds tell us that our, um, our habitat is healthy. There's a ton of different rabbit holes we could go down to, but birds and all these animals as you move up the, the trophic level only tell us so much because they're still part of that trophic pyramid that we're missing. We haven't seen yet. The apex predators. For us, it's lions. Historically, it would be mountain lions, jaguars, red wolves, and black bears. The last jaguar was shot 22 miles as the crow flies from where I sit right now in 1923. That's not even a hundred years ago. We still had jaguars in central Texas. That is awesome. And I love to think about that. And maybe you're familiar with jaguars making their way back into Arizona, but I can guarantee you jaguars are never gonna make their way back into central Texas. The landscapes are not connected the way they used to be. So again, those dense jungles coming up from um, the, the equator, the jaguars range went from um, Brazil all the way into uh, central Texas and about halfway up the mountain chains in Arizona and Western New Mexico, the Chiricahuas and the Huachucas. And there's even stories of them getting into Louisiana. And they get into Louisiana by coming through central Texas and riding on those river systems into those dense swamps that are in East Texas and um, Western Louisiana. So that kind of connectivity is really important. Well, all that area now is either ranch or farmland. The reason the jaguars were killed, because jaguars eat cows, goats, and sheep. It cost a lot of money um, to do that. But that's proof by having those large carnivores on your landscape, it shows you your, your ecosystem is intact. You have top down regulation, you know, because we're also not getting bison back that can move historically. So the numbers are never going to be the same, but we still do have mountain lions on the ranch. And don't tell anybody, but we're currently working with fish and wildlife to see if we can get a small herd of red wolves introduced back to the landscape to really see what would happen and if a Yellowstone situation would be um, created. Because we want more water, even though we have water and we're doing really, um, really well in terms of our ecosystem, 
restoration is never complete. It's never done. It's always a process of changing that. So these, um, these mountain lions, the apex predators have now been replaced on our landscape by the meso mammal. So the rise of the meso mammal all started by getting rid of the wolves and getting rid of the mountain lions. So by meso mammal, I'm of course talking about bobcats and coyotes. You know, their ranges have expanded and their numbers have expanded as wolves and bears were extirpated from our landscape. And you can see meso meaning middle. So these are your middle um, trophic levels. So they're definitely not the top. Mountain lions eat a ton of bobcats. Bears eat bobcats. Lots of things eat bobcats, but they have to be there to eat the bobcat. So with Civil War expansion of the American Southwest and getting rid of wolves, bobcat numbers really increased. But so did coyote numbers. There were no coyotes um, in, in, in this area. You know, coyotes would follow wolves. They're solitary creatures um, and they would follow the wolves. And the bobcats would, would occupy most of North America at that time, but they're solitary hunters too. And there just weren't the numbers that there are now, but those numbers are there because the niche has been exploited. There's an opening, something has to fill it. And so those meso mammals fill the role now of the apex predators. Now, bobcats, their scientific name is lynx rufus. Okay, that's the red lynx as sometimes they are called. They are a small wildcat. They weigh somewhere between 10 and 40 pounds and they stand somewhere between 12 and 24 inches tall. So they're not really big. And for context, a really big mountain lion in central Texas is going to be somewhere between 80 and 100 pounds. As you keep going further north, like where you are in, in um, Northern California, they're going to start around that 100, 120 pound range and then keep going north um, from there. That's all, all, rel uh, all related to Bergman's rule. Um, so these bobcats are highly successful and adaptable. And one of the reasons that their numbers were able to increase is because they're considered habitat generalists. So they can live in dense forest or they can live in arid deserts all over the place. And they can even live in cities these days. So the places where they were extirpated um, are gonna be areas like New York City, and the farmlands of Pennsylvania and Delaware and New Jersey. Um, and if you go north into Canada, you have bobcats, but you also have their, their sister taxa, the Canadian lynx. Okay. Now you see lynx are a lot bigger than bobcats and they have the enlarged tufts on the top of their ears. So they're bigger and their, their ear tufts are um, also larger. But the home range of the bobcat used to be historically everywhere from Canada throughout into and almost reaching Mexico City in the Walken Mountains. So they're just really good. So if you have bobcats on your property, it means that your, your ecosystem is pretty much complete. And they've recolonized um, those states like New York and they've recolonized Pennsylvania. And to my knowledge, I think the only state that doesn't have them back is Delaware. But I have a feeling that's sampling bias with just not enough people are out there um, and looking for them. So when you think about all of this stuff um, here in, in Texas, we have a, another small cat. It's a little bit smaller than the bobcat called the ocelot. And there's a, a great um, film by filmmaker Ben Masters, who's a, a good friend of mine. And he spent a lot of time in South Texas uh, filming these, these animals. They're endangered in Texas, and they used to range where the jaguar ranged. Um, and there's just, I don't know, maybe a couple dozen in the wild, but there's tens of thousands of them in Central America where that forested landscape that they need so much is still intact. So here in Central Texas, we couldn't manage to get ocelot. It would just be too hard. We don't have the dense thorn scrub that they need. Our forest systems aren't dense enough, but we can manage properly for bobcats to keep bobcats on the landscape and keep a good number of bobcats. 
So bobcats are these amazing predators and they eat a, uh, a vast diet of rodents, birds, and rabbits. And I wanna say all of these photographs that I'm showing you of bobcats were taken by my friend, um, Karen, who is a National Geographic photographer. She is currently working on a big documentary on bobcats. And she had a, a big article of her work uh, published in National Geographic uh, last year, I believe. So some of these images are from that. And she let me um, use these pictures for this um, program. And the ranch where she's doing a lot of this work on is about 90 miles from uh, the Bamberger Ranch Preserve. So still in the hill country, the Edwards Plateau region of central Texas. So when a lot of times you'll also hear that bobcats eat deer. And while a bobcat might occasionally happen to come upon a deer that's bedded down and be lucky enough to actually kill it. When you think of a, even a big bobcat at 40 pounds trying to take down even a small doe at 70 to 80 pounds, it would be really, really difficult. But they can eat fawns pretty easily because they are um, bigger than the fawn. And the first couple of days of a fawn's life, they don't move. You know, that's why they're spotted. So they're just laying down in the brush. So bobcats will eat them if they're given a chance. So bobcats, once they re they reach maturity, have very few predators these days. Again, it was the wolves and mountain lions that used to eat them as adults. But at, when they're kittens, they are vulnerable to hawks and owls and even big snakes and um, other predators of that size. And if these kittens survive to adulthood, they can live somewhere between seven and 10 years and they can reproduce um, that whole entire time. They're largely solitary when they become adults. It's, it's, it's not rare to see two of them together. It's rare to see them together for a long period of time. So if your land has bobcats, it has to be healthy because you have to have enough rodents like this cotton rat. And those cotton rats eat seeds from grass and seeds from legumes and other um, nuts um, from the trees and plants. So you see, it's all tied back to plants. It's all tied back to the primary producers. So bobcats want this mixed use landscape with lots of birds, lots of rodents and rabbits. They're constantly moving across the landscape, which is why roads and habitat conversion into farmland is a big threat to them. And their home range is a really strange thing. Um, we have uh, game cameras all over the ranch. And what I'm monitoring with these cameras are actually our quail population. So we have these, um, these quail posts um, set up every linear mile. And so we've got seven of those um, on our transect that go from the front of the ranch. The closest one is about uh, 100 meters from where I'm sitting right now at my house. And all the way um, seven miles, because the roads kind of twist and turn, uh, to the back of the ranch. And I've been monitoring what our quail population has been doing as an indicator species to tell us how our grass is doing. Quail, you know, need those, um, they need forbs and they need grass seeds that are teeny tiny, you know, like a sunflower kernel to eat. And they also need a mixed area landscape. So they need enough trees and vegetation to escape predators like feral hogs, raccoons, foxes, and bobcats. But they also need that denning and nesting material that comes from those clump grasses and those forbs, um, like a really popular um, den grass for them to be in is that little blue stem that I was um, uh, running on about earlier. And so when you have those things, you can manage your landscape accordingly. And these bobcats, you know, their home range kind of depends on where you are. In California, there's a study in Southern California that says the bobcat's home range is about one bobcat per 10 square miles. Here in Central Texas, a study said it's about one every five square miles. On the ranch, I would say they're both wrong. It's like one per half square mile, okay? We have a lot of bobcats. And the reason I know we have a lot of bobcats is from those quail um, posts. I put cameras up on them and I can see bobcats moving in and out. As scientists, 
We love animals that have spots. Because if you have a picture like this, you can identify this cat. So my friend Karen has been on this ranch now working for, for three years and knows all of these cats. She has names for all of these cats and it's all based on this spot pattern. So that's another really good way to kind of grade yourself as a habitat manager. When you have these cameras out on the landscape and you see what's going on um, with these animals moving in and out, you can see if they're sticking around, if they're just passing through by looking at things like their spots. So wildflowers, shrubs, grasses, trees, forests, habitats, all of this stuff is tied back to that energy and it's really important. And it all is going to start with that first step. A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single mile, actually begins with a single footstep. So when you think about writing a management plan and you think about habitat restoration, this is not something that can happen overnight. Every time I go do a land consultation for somebody, the first question I ask them is, how long have you been the steward of this property? For some people, it's as little as six weeks. And I go, well, for six weeks, you can't start to understand what mother nature wants to do, how the system wants to act independently. You have to spend at least a year and you have to see how those big rainstorms affect the landscape. You have to see what getting rid of the grazers will do. You have to see what providing regulation on your browsers, like deer hunt. You have to start trapping pigs, control those predators that are so bad on the landscape. And once you do that, you have to start looking for things, for signs, like the bird species coming back. Then you have to know what species of bird you have to know what that tells you about your habitat. And once you know that, you can start to think about, okay, now what can I do to increase biodiversity across our landscape? Is it bringing animals back? Is it high intensity grazing? Is it 150 bison in this pasture for two days and then not bringing them back again for three years or four years? Is it frequent fires and no animal impact, right? So by trying these things is how you learn. It's the experience. I have been on the Bamberger Ranch since 2006, um, off and on. I've been full-time out here. I've been living out here since 2013. So I've seen a lot of change. And it's not that our management has changed. Our management is still the same, but the landscape is constantly changing, which means we have to constantly keep up with that and we have to adapt what practices we're doing. Aldo Leopold is the father of um, modern habitat restoration and game management. And he is uh, very famous for saying, he's a fantastic author. I hope all of you read the book, Sand County Almanac. Uh, I first read that when I was 14, and I still have that copy with all the highlights and dog ears and all my notes in it. It, it completely changed my life. And Sand County Almanac is kind of the, the seminal piece of Leopold. Leopold was a forester. He graduated from Yale School of Forestry. He ran the BLM. Um, he was head of forestry. He lived all over the United States and watched these forests in the early part of the century turn. And in that book, San County Almanac, he has a passage called Thinking Like a Mountain. And thinking like a mountain is what we all have to do. For it was his job when he first worked for the Forest Service to kill all of the wolves because they thought that the wolves pulled the range down, like the wolves killing all the deer. But what they didn't realize is by getting rid of the wolves, you actually killed the mountain. And there were so many mouths, so much biomass, so many animal units on that landscape that those landscapes became barren wastelands. Those fires in Arizona right now are in those same areas where Leopold was hunting wolves in the early 1900s. And his seminal in his big book called Game Management, which was written in 1933 or 1936, he very famously said, the same tools that destroyed the range or system are the same tools that can build it back up. The cow, the plow, the match, the ax, and the gun. Those are the only five tools that you need. 
but it's understanding how to use them and when to use them, understanding your system, okay? That helps you with that. So that is the end of me rambling. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I had a question with, like you said that the um, diversity of species is increased. Um, with like repairing capacity of the landscape, is there ever a time that there's just too much? Uh, too, too much in terms of what? In terms of diversity, like um, too many bird species or too many just species. Yeah, so... I think I understand the question. And the answer is you can never have too much diversity in terms of your plant species, because diversity means you have a balanced ecosystem. There's not too much of this or too much of this. So it's not too much of this one plant, right? You, you have this intermingling of plants. It's when you see that balance, right? That heterozygosity, those differences in that diversity coming down that you have to start to worry. So you can have too much biomass on the landscape and that can come in the form of all sorts of diversity. There are a lot of ranches that will run, you know, cows, goats, sheep, all on the same um, paddock. And that's probably too much. So it all comes down to that balance between the biomass of your plants and the biomass of your consumers and how that trickles up and down your, um, your trophic pyramid. So you can't have too much plant diversity, but you can have too many mouths on the landscape, too much biomass on the landscape. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, any other questions? All right. Cool. Well, well you, can always, you can always email me if you have uh, any more questions. And, and I really do hope that everybody kind of understands how important ecology is, how important understanding the key concepts of the connectivity of systems are, and how it starts with water, then it builds up through those levels, right? And soil is the key to all of it. And the best thing for soil, the best thing for water are grasses. But those grasses should eventually turn into a forested system. So you have to know where you are historically, and you have to know what that land was historically, you know, think 300 years ago to really have the most productive land possible. Is there like um, a website they could go to if they wanted to learn more about this stuff? You can definitely go to bambergerranch.org um, and there's more of our story and more um, details on that. Bamberger Ranch has a YouTube channel um, that we're building up that has some resources on more highlights of the ranch and kind of more of the stories. And we've partnered recently with the Texas A&M Natural Resource Institute. And we have been doing these um, TV shows called Leopold Live. And you can find those on the Texas A&M NRI website. Um, and you can find links to them through our website and our YouTube channel. But we're basically, we take you through each week one of Leopold's tools and how we've used it here on the ranch. So that would be a really good resource for you is finding that Leopold Live. It might be easier to go to the Bamberger Ranch Facebook page um, and find it that way. Um, and then you can see the differences and what the modern axe looks like because ax is, a, is, a, is, is more than it was when Leopold wrote that. No longer just a tool to swing and chop down a tree. We're talking chainsaws, brush cutters, hydro axes, which are big units that go on top of um, skid loaders and they mulch trees down, right? So the tools have changed a little bit, but the concepts haven't. Mm -hmm. So Leopold Live would be a good start for that. 